Thank you, Brother Armacost. It's good to be here today. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you, Pastor Dameron, for the invitation to come and uh, to address uh, the student body here at Fairhaven Baptist College. And uh, he was mentioning that uh, your pastor, of course, grew up in our church and in our Christian school, I think was a 1989 graduate. And I remember vividly that year uh, that you guys had a dynamite soccer team. And I think maybe just lost one game the whole year. And uh, I remember going to the games. I was just a little guy. I was, I was maybe 10 years old. I hope that doesn't make Pastor Dameron feel too old here today. Uh, but I remember watching them play. And uh, he was really, really good. I don't know what he's like today. I don't know if he still has uh, any of that uh, talent left over in him. It's amazing as we age uh, what uh, begins to happen to our, to our physical bodies and the endurance and that sort of thing just aren't quite theirs like they used to be. Uh, but I do vividly remember watching him and watching his younger brother uh, also uh, playing on the uh, basketball court in the soccer field. And uh, it is great to have Brother and Mrs. Dameron here. Thank you so much for coming. What a, uh, what a delight it is to have you here. Look forward to uh, connecting with you after the service. Uh, well, let's take our Bibles and go to the Joshua chapter number 17, the Old Testament book of Joshua, in chapter number 17. And I want to take just a special opportunity here uh, to thank uh, two men from our church for accompanying me on this trip. Uh, Brother Bruce Witzke uh, was actually uh, my principal, was Pastor Dameron's principal uh, for many years, now serves on the church side of our ministry, overseeing our bus ministry, a lot of our outreach. And uh, the man is a soul winner, has a heart for souls. And, uh, and he just has, he's just a tender-hearted man. I love Brother Witzke. I'm thankful for his influence on my life. And, uh, and he and I have been partners in travel here quite a bit recently. Just uh, came off of a road trip uh, over the weekend. And uh, here we are again. And then Brother Jeff Noyes is next to him. And uh, Brother Noyes is just a faithful man in our church. He's a pilot uh, with Spirit Airlines. And, um, and uh, caught me on Sunday. I'd just, I'd just driven all night to get back from performing a wedding in Huntsville, Alabama, so I could be in our church to preach on Sunday morning. And uh, he, he must have known that I, had, that I was exhausted. I think just by looking at me, uh, he could tell. And he said, hey, would you, would you, I know you got this trip coming up to Fairhaven. Would you like for me to fly you up there uh, so you don't have to drive? And I said, I would love that. And so uh, Brother Witzke and I went out to uh, a private airport uh, not too far from where we are and flew me in last night. And then we'll uh, finish up here. We'll fly home today uh, because I've got something with my family. I've got to be back at uh, tonight. So uh, thank you, Brother Noyce. Thank you so much for being willing to do that. Uh, very kind uh, of him, and, uh, and I certainly am blessed by that. Well, we're in Joshua chapter number 17. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 14, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter uh, here in Joshua chapter 17. The Bible says this, And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot and one portion to inherit, seeing I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. And the children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us. And all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Beth Shean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people, and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down, and the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this good day that you've given us, and I thank you for, uh, Lord, uh, these uh, two groups of students, uh, students in the junior high and high school, that are here with us today, Lord, specific needs certainly that they have in their own individual lives as they make plans for their future. And then, Lord, I look at the student body of the Fairhaven Baptist College in front of me and thank you for their desire to, uh, to study your word and, uh, Lord, their um, desire to serve you. And many of them will end up serving you in full-time Christian ministry and will completely give their lives to that. Thank you for that. Thank you that there are still young people like that that have a desire to to serve and, and to use their lives uh, for, your, for your plan and for your purpose. And Lord, we do pray that you'd bless our time together today. Help me as I attempt to uh, teach this passage and what I believe the Bible has for us here. I pray that it'll be a help uh, to uh, both of these groups of students. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the middle portion of the book of Joshua uh, captures the 
uh, dividing of the promised land among the various tribes. And I got to be honest with you, I was reading the book of Joshua a few years ago in my own personal Bible reading. And of course, the beginning of the book is thrilling. It's exciting. Uh, there's battles that are being fought and uh, there are cities that are being taken and the walls of Jericho are, uh, are collapsing and, and uh, the battle at Ai and of course the initial fight that resulted in a, in a, in a loss for the nation of Israel. Then of course there was sin in the camp and uh, they, got, they got things right there and then they went back and they conquered Ai and just a lot of exciting things there in the beginning of the book of Joshua. Even the crossing of the Jordan River is, is fascinating as the priests were the first to step their feet in the water and when they did, the waters uh, divided and they were able to cross uh, on dry land. And so the book of Joshua starts with a bang. It's exciting and it's thrilling. And then you come to kind of the middle portion and it slows down quite a bit in excitement. It would have been exciting for them because the middle portion is Joshua saying, okay, now this tribe over here, you, you're going to get this plot of land. This is going to be where you're going to build your homes and your communities and where you're going to set up your, uh, your houses and your lands. So it would have been thrilling for them, but for us as we read it, you know, it's a lot of borders. It's this river to that body of water. It's this mountain down to this valley. And, you know, so for us, it's not exactly all that thrilling and all that exciting. And I, and I, and I just got to be transparent with you. I'm not a whole lot different than anybody else. And sometimes, you know, I get to a chapter and I see it's going to be nothing but names or it's going to be nothing but geographic locations. And, and, and I think to myself, you know, maybe there's really not a whole lot for me here. And I was reading through the book of Joshua and I'd gotten to that point in which I'm like, I'm, all right, I'm doing it because I know that there's, there's a reason why God has given us this, but I don't necessarily know that I'm going to get much out of my, my, my personal reading here today. And right in the middle of all of that, I happen upon jo Joshua chapter 17. And I begin reading in verse number 14. I read down through verse number 18 and I'm introduced to this, this tribe of people and their their dissatisfaction with what they were given. They're, 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 it's unmistakable. They're not real thrilled with, with the plot of land that they have, they have been given. Let me try to give you just a little bit of, just a little bit of background. The, the two tribes that are spoken of here are the, are, are the product of, uh, of, of Joseph's life. They are his sons. The sons' names are Ephraim and Manasseh. And uh, there's not really a tribe necessarily of Joseph but there's a tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. And, and, and so they would represent two of the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, now, to understand a little bit of the background, you have to understand that there's the half-tribe of Manasseh was one of the tribes, along with the tribes of Reuben and Gad, that had already received their land on the other side of the Jordan River. Now, I know this is maybe a little bit laborious, but I, I think it'll help us to understand what exactly is happening here, all right? So, so if you were to take your Bible, we won't do that now, but if you were to take your Bible and you go back to Numbers chapter number 32, the children of Israel are still not in the promised land. They're still in their wilderness wandering, but they're close. They're not far from crossing the Jordan River. And these two and a half tribes, Reuben, Gad, and the half tribe of Manasseh came to Joshua, or came to Moses, I should say, and they said, look, we, we, we really think that this land here is really good land. And would it be okay if we just decided, rather than going in the promised land, can we just stay here? And the land that they had, that they had chosen was the land of Gilead, and it was good for, for cattle and for livestock, and they would, that, that was what those tribes did. So Moses went to the Lord about it, and, and, and God gave them permission. God said, yeah, that, that'd be fine. They can stay on the other side of the Jordan River. They, they don't have to go into the promised land and inhabit that along with the rest of you. But there, it, was, it was under one condition. The one condition was this, that when it came time to go into the promised land, the men from those tribes would go along and they would fight the battles as well. And so they all came to this agreement. Uh, the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, we're going to dwell over here. This is going to be our land. And, uh, and, and yet we're going to go with you when it's time to fight the battles. We'll leave our families here. We'll cross the Jordan. We'll fight along with you. And then we'll come back when the, when the battles are over. All right, so, so, so that's on the other side of the Jordan. Now we're on this side of the Jordan, and we're dividing up the land. And it comes time now for Joshua to divide the land for the tribe of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh. And so in their minds, they're thinking, well, we're not, we're not two complete tribes. We're, we're kind of one and a half tribe, but, but, but we should get more land than what maybe one tribe would get because we're maybe not fully two, but we're more than just one. And so they're making this assumption. 
Can I, can I stop here for just a moment and can I tell you that assumptions can be very dangerous things, can't they? You know, a lot of times we do, we live our life by assumption. Well, I did this, so I just assume that this is going to happen. And when it doesn't happen, we can be disappointed. We can grow frustrated. We can grow weary. We can even grow discouraged. And so they're, they're making, in their minds, they're making this assumption, we're going to get a whole lot of land because we're more than just one tribe. Joshua divides the land, and they begin to look at it, and we find that they issue a complaint. And what their complaint is this, that what we have received is not sufficient. It's not enough. We should get more because we're, we're bigger than the average tribe because we're one and a half tribes. And maybe they thought by voicing their disapproval to Joshua that he would automatically just come to their aid. And maybe they had good reason to think that. After all, Joshua was a member of the tribe of Ephraim. They perhaps thought they had an in. You know, hey, we, 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 uh, he's one of us, so he for sure is going to give in, and he's going, to, he's going to give us more just because we come to him and we ask him. But I think that Joshua's response is a rather interesting one. For rather than capitulating to their demands, Joshua tells them, look, guys, if you're dissatisfied with what you've been given, then maybe you should do something about it yourself. And that's the response that Joshua gives. It is, it is anti what you and I would expect. It's certainly anti what our culture is because today our culture is all about, well, let's just, let's just give in, let's just give people what they want. And hopefully they'll like us, hopefully they'll, they'll appreciate what we're trying to accomplish and, and, and they'll be on our side, they'll be with us forever. Joshua does not have that attitude. He does not have that spirit. His attitude is not, okay, yeah, I have the ability to give you more land and so I'm just going to yield to that. I'm going to, I'm going to give in. I'm going to give you what you're asking for. No, no. He says, you want more? Go get more. You want something greater? Go get greater. But don't expect for me just to hand it to you. Don't expect me just to give it to you. You want it. You can have it. But you're going to have to work for it. I want you to know that this is a powerful lesson. And this is a lesson I believe that everyone must learn eventually and I'm speaking specifically to you young people in the Bible college today. You have plans and you have dreams and visions and goals for your future. I hope you do. I hope you've got uh, something that, that you believe that God has given you to accomplish. But I want you to know something. God's not just going to hand it to you. you know, we, we, sometimes we get this idea through preaching and teaching that, you know, God is just, you know, this, this genie in a, in a bottle and we kind of rub it and he pops out and says, what, what do you want? Man, the Christian life doesn't work that way. I want you to know something. Christian life is hard work. And listen, if the Christian life is hard work, you, you better be for sure and certain that ministry life is even harder. Growing a church and, and, and building a group of people and, and, and trying to help marriages stay together and trying to, uh, to counsel young people and to try to keep them on the right path. Look, if it's, if it's hard in your own personal life, trying to help others is even harder. And if we, if we want something... If we, if we feel like this is a burden and a vision that God has given us, I want you to know something. More often than not, God's not just going to hand it to us. We're going to we're gonna have to work at it. We're going to have to carve it out with hard work and with effort. And, and this is something that we need to learn if we're going to live a successful life of achievement and accomplishment. I mean, I'm looking at some high school students over here and over here. And maybe we're still towards the beginning of the year. Maybe you started this year with some grand plans and goals, right? You know, I, I want to I hire GPA. I want to I wanna have a better, you know, sports year than I had, you know, last year. And, and uh, you know, maybe I want to take some steps forward spiritually in my leadership in my Christian school and in my church. And so in your mind, you're thinking, you know, this is what I want. And here we are, we're two months into the school year. Some of you have maybe come to the, re the, the, the hard realization that, wow, it's just not going to be as easy as I thought it was going to be. And the grades aren't just going to happen. I'm going to have to work at it. I'm going to have to study. I'm going to have to, here's the novel thought, I'm going to have to turn my homework in on time. Honestly, I, it, it amazes me. How many kids just blow off homework? You know, I, you know, I forgot. I didn't have time. I was, I was playing Fortnite, you know, and, and uh, you know, I just, just didn't get around to it. And, you know, I was watching the basketball game, or I was watching this, or I was watching that. And, and, and I'm sitting here saying, well, look, if that's the choice you made, fine, but don't expect to accomplish much in life. 
You know, if that's going to be your attitude and that's going to be your spirit, hey, so be it. But don't, accomp- don't expect that you're going to make much of, a, much of an impact in life and on others. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, we're living in a day and age in which parents are just giving their kids everything. You want it? You can have it. My daughter came to me not too long ago. She's in ninth grade. She said, Dad, when am I going to get my first cell phone? Oh, man, I knew that question was coming. I knew it was coming. And I looked at her, and I said, when you need it? <laughs> she said, when's that? And I said, well, I don't exactly know at this point. <laughs> but I, I, I said, maybe when you, get to, when you get a driver's license. I mean, I think if you're, if you're, if you're capable of, of, of operating an automobile, you might be capable of, of maintaining a cell phone, you know. I don't know. I, I haven't completely decided. But I'm sitting here saying, you know, my, my, my kids, there, there's kids in, in fourth, fifth grade walking around with smartphones. Are you kidding me? What, what does a fourth to fifth grader need a smartphone for? That's a scary thought. When you think what's, what's available to them on those things. And I'm just saying that that's indicative of our culture. Parents that are just giving their kids everything. A, a kid gets himself into some trouble in school or, or, or finds some struggles in, 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 his, in his academic work. And, and rather than the parents saying, hey, you need to buckle down, you need to get to work, the parent goes to the teacher and starts complaining. You're giving them too much work. You need to take it a little bit easier on them. They're busy. And I'm thinking to myself, no wonder we're raising losers in our culture, in our society, because nobody has to work for anything anymore. I want you to know something. That's not, that's not real life. If you're going to accomplish something in life, you have to work for it. And Joshua is teaching the tribe of, uh, of Ephraim and the half-tribe of Manasseh, look, there's some valuable lessons that you need to learn here I want to ask you this question. Do you currently find yourself dissatisfied with some aspect of your life? I answer that sincerely. Is there some aspect of your life that you say, I'm just not completely whole here in this area? Maybe it's, maybe it's some besetting sin that you've been battling. You haven't completely gotten the victory over it, and you know you haven't. And it eats away at you. It bothers you. Perhaps maybe you're not the soul winner that you'd like to be, or maybe you look across the aisle at someone and you think to yourself, you know, I should be, I should be the, the level of Christian that they are, but for whatever reason, I'm not just yet. You know, there might be a temptation to go to God and say, God, make me this. Maybe God is looking at you saying, you want it? Go get it. You believe that that's what you ought to be? You want to be a better soul winner? Well, start carrying some more tracks. And start praying that I give you a greater burden. Don't just pray that I'll make it happen. But you start putting some things in your life that will help you to be a better soul winner. You want to, better, you want to be a better student? I, I was one of those students, you know, teachers would pray at the beginning of a class, Lord, help these students to recall the things that they studied. I was praying, Lord, help me to recall the things I didn't study. You know, that, that was the kind of student I was often. And you know what? God never one time answered that prayer. Can you believe that? He never, never answered that prayer. And, 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 and there would were, were be times, I remember there were times when I was in elementary school. I mean, look, I, I'm, I'm praying to the God who opened blind eyes. I'm praying to the God who, uh, you know, who turned, you know, f- you know five loaves of bread and, and two fishes into, in, into a meal for 5,000. Certainly he could change my test scores. I mean, I used to think that. I used to think, man, I know I left that answer blank, but God, you're, you're powerful enough to put an answer in there for me. That, that, those things went through my mind when I was like in fourth and fifth grade. And it never happened. You know why? Because I've got to work for it. God, God doesn't, listen, God doesn't do things for me that I ought to be doing for myself. He, he is not that genie in the bottle that oftentimes Christians portray him to be. He's there to help us. Make no mistake about that. He's there to guide and his power is available. He's not going to step over and do things for you that you should be doing for yourself. So I want us to notice a few Compelling thoughts from this passage of Scripture, and, and we'll be done this morning. Number one, I think Joshua's refusal to do for these people what they could do for themselves reveals and helps them to learn the importance of hard work. And notice with me in verse number 15, and Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, and get thee up to the wood country, and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. Now listen, there's a lesson here. Don't miss it. See, the land that, that Joshua had given them was plenty big enough. It was plenty big. It was plenty of enough room. He's, he's telling them that. But here's what he's also telling them. He's saying, look, 
It's big enough if you're willing to put the work in. If you're willing to go up on that mountain up there and you're willing to take some saws and some sharp instruments and you're willing to put some elbow grease into it and put some muscle into it, you can begin to cut down some trees up there. And you can begin to clear some land up there. There, there, There's plenty enough land for your families and for the succeeding generations that will come behind you, but you're going to have to work for it. You're going to have to cut some things down. You're going to have to remove some things that are there. You see, the dense forest had to be removed in order for them to be able to build homes and be able to build cities and villages. And they looked at it and they saw the forest. They said, well, we can't do anything with that. It's uninhabitable. And Joshua says, yeah, it's uninhabitable, but you have within you the ability to make it habitable with hard work and with effort and with dedication and discipline and diligence. You can cut some things down. You can remove some things and you can even take that which you cut down and you can begin to build off of that, taking the wood that was removed from those, from those trees that were there. Build your own houses. You're going to have to work for it, though. I'm thinking to myself, you know, that's not really all that different from the Christian life. I'll hold your place there in Joshua 17 and go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. You see, the Bible's clear that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning. That we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. So what the children of Israel were dealing with, it, it helps us to learn a lesson. And Peter, I think, gives us that lesson here in 2 Peter in chapter number 1. Look in verse number 3. He says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now, don't miss this. The land that Joshua had given them, it it, it held everything that they needed. There was enough land for them. They just had to work at it to tear the things down that needed to be torn down. And then maybe even taking that which they tore down and using it to make it to build whatever they needed to build. Just in the same way, God says, when you got saved, I gave unto you everything that you need to live the Christian life. Now listen, a lot of it wasn't, a lot of it wasn't built already. You're going to have to build some of those things, and he gives us some instruction on that. Look, he says in verse number, verse number four, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Notice, and beside this, giving all diligence, Add to your faith. So faith is the starting point, right? We get saved, and that's, the, that's the, the foundation of our Christian life is faith. Here's the problem. A lot of people never do anything else other than that. They get saved. They have faith. They believe in Jesus Christ, but, but nothing else ever is built. Why? Because they don't want to put the hard work in. Or maybe, maybe because nobody ever teaches them. Nobody, they, 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 nobody disciples them. Nobody brings them along. Nobody trains them. So the foundation is faith. So I'm going to make the assumption in this room today that all of you have the foundation in place. If you don't, you can, you can get that in place today. You can repent of your sins today. You can trust Jesus Christ as your Savior today. But listen, all of you, you have the plot of land at this point in time. And some of you, some of you, maybe you've begun to say, like the children of Manasseh and Ephraim, you've begun to say to God, God, it's, it's not enough. You haven't given me enough, and, and, I, and I want more. Well, look, your desire for more is an admirable desire, but maybe God's response to you is similar to Joshua's response to them. You want more, go get more. It tells us that here in this passage. Add to your faith what? Add to your faith virtue. And to virtue, knowledge. And to knowledge, temperance. And a temperance, patience. You see what's happening here? We've got our foundation. Now we're starting to build. We're building through virtue and we're building through knowledge and we're building through temperance and we're building through patience and we're building through godliness and through godliness we're building kindness and we're building charity. Before long, all of a sudden, I've cleared some things in my Christian life. I've knocked down some obstacles. I've cleared some land. There's sufficient land for me to be able to build something. Listen, who's who's doing that? I'm doing that. I'm adding to my faith these things. I'm pursuing these things. I'm going after these things. I'm believing that this is what God wants for my life. And I'm not sitting around saying, God, just give me this. No, no, no. If I want it, I'm going in. I'm getting it. Putting some things in place. I'm erecting some, maybe some standards and some convictions that will keep me from wandering this way or that way. And I'm building some things. And, 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 and the foundation is in place. God gives me the foundation. 
but I've got to go and I've got to pursue those other things. And I'm thinking to myself, ministry life. Some of you are going to get into a church somewhere and you're going to be pastoring. You're going to get onto a mission field and you're going to be serving and be trying to start a church. And you're going to, you're going to get down on your knees and you say, God, God, please give me people. And God's going to say to you, go get people. Go, go, go talk to people. Go pass out tracts. Have a burden for people. But I'm not just going to bring them to you. You've got to go get them. And some of you are going to pray, God, give us a building. Give us a bigger building. God, give us this. Give us that. And God says, look, why don't you go and start looking for some of those things? Why don't you develop some relationships? Why don't you start pursuing some of those things? Because in many cases, God does not do for us what we can do for ourselves. So these people learn the importance of hard work. And you're learning that right now. Some of you, you got a test back today and it wasn't what you were hoping for. You know, it taught you, it taught you, hey, if I'm gonna get the grade, I've gotta put the work in. I gotta spend more time studying. What I, whatever I spent last time wasn't enough. And I gotta, I gotta be more disciplined and diligent when I'm sitting in the classroom listening to the teachers and the professors. I, I, I've gotta, I've gotta get, I've gotta buy in here. I've gotta focus. I, I can't just expect it to happen. I've got to work at it. Secondly, notice they learn the value of facing their fears. Not only do they learn the importance of hard work, but they learn the value of facing their fears. Look at verse 15 again, going back to Joshua 17. Joshua chapter 17, verse number 15. Joshua answered them, If thou be a great country, of excuse me, great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down for thyself there in the land of the Perizzites and of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow for thee. The children of Joseph said, The hill is not enough for us, and all the Canaanites that dwell in the land of the valley have chariots of iron, both they who are of Bethshean and her towns, and they who are of the valley of Jezreel. We learn in verses 15 and 16 that the two tribes here, the tribe and a half here, were dealing with two primary fears. Fears are these, giants and chariots of iron. Now, the fear of giants had plagued the Israelites for a long time, for many years. In fact, there was a singular reason that they were delayed more than 39 years from entering the promised land. We learn of that in Numbers chapter 13, verses 31 to 33, one of the saddest passages of Scripture in all the Bible. You know the story, the, 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 the uh, spies came back and ten were bad and two were good. Remember that story? And the ten said, man, there are, there's everything that God said there would be in that land, but there's also giants and we can't do it. And the two spies that were good, Joshua and Caleb said, yeah, there are giants, but our God is bigger than they are. And we can, we can, we can enter this land and we can conquer it. And the people believed the ten spies, and they refused to believe the two spies. And, and I mean, it was, it was a bad, bad time in the children of Israel's history, and it set them back nearly 40 years from doing that which God intended them to do. The fear of chariots of iron seems to be maybe a little bit more of a newer fear, and we certainly would understand it by contrast from what we can tell. The children of Israel had no chariots at all. They didn't even have chariots of wood, much less chariots of iron. And so the children of Israel, wherever they went, they walked or they marched. They had no, they had no vehicle that was carrying them. And, and, and so as a result, they, uh, they, they felt quite inadequate. So they look at this plot that God has given them, and Joshua's divided to them, and they say, we can't do this. Because in that land, there are giants, and there's chariots of iron. And we're normal, we're not giants, and we don't have any chariots at all. Can I tell you that they were convinced they didn't stand a chance against these enemies for these reasons? And in much the same way, I, I feel like there probably are some young people in this room, you feel very similarly. You look at the road ahead that God has called you to do and you think to yourself, I am so inadequate to do what God has given me to do. I mean, how, how am I ever gonna stand and preach a message? I can't even hardly stand and give a speech in speech class. How am, I, how am I ever going to be, how am I ever going to be what God, how, how, you know, go to the mission field? How am I going to raise money to do that sort of thing? How am I going to pastor people I can barely lead myself? And you're sitting here and you're processing these thoughts. You say, how do you know these things? Because I've been there before. I know what it was like to be in Bible college. I know what it was like to watch as men came through and to sit there and say, man, I, I, I could never do what that guy does. I could never be in that place or do that. I want you to know something. God wants you to face your fears. And Joshua could have said, you know what, you're right. 
There are some giants there and there's some chariots of iron. Let me find you another plot of land, but that's not what he did. He could have done that. He might have even been tempted to do that. Listen, they would have never learned the value and the importance of facing their fears. Can I tell you, the New Testament has something to say about that as well. According to 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 4, I love this verse, year of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater, greater, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And I want you to also know something. 2 Timothy 1, 7 is still in the Bible. And it says this, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. I just want you to know something. God's job is not to eliminate every obstacle in your life. Whatever it is that you're afraid of, God's, God's role and God's ministry to you is not just to remove that so you don't have to be afraid anymore. No, no, no. God's job, God's goal, God's desire is to give you the spirit of love, the spirit of power, and the spirit of a sound mind. For you to walk boldly into that into the face of whatever it is that you're afraid of, and for you to do that which God has given you to do. You've got to face your fear. God, God, God is not here just to eliminate enemies, but, but he's to fill us with power and love and a sound mind. And Joshua recognized the value in them fighting some battles. You see, if, if, if Joshua said, yeah, sure, I'll give you, I'll give you some land that, you know, that, that, that doesn't have giants in it and doesn't have anybody with chariots of iron, they would have never seen, they would have never seen God's amazing power. As God enabled them to drive out these giants. As God enabled them to overcome chariots of iron with no chariots at all. And I want you to know something. God wants to do the same thing in your life today too. God wants you to face some things, face some fears. I don't know what it is. Some of you, you've already faced a fear by coming to Bible college. That was a scary thing to leave home and to leave your comfort zone and to come here. Listen, God's job isn't to eliminate your school bill. <laughs> I, 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 I remember thinking that. Lord, if you can just somehow just, you know, when I walk to my mailbox today, just put $1,500 there in the thing so that I can pay my bill. God doesn't work that way. God, God sometimes wants us to face moments like that. Because here's what it does. It drives us to our knees. It drives us to, uh, to, to finding God and, and, and to recognizing uh, that, that I have a responsibility in some areas. And so Joshua recognized the value in them fighting some battles on their own so that they could have firsthand experience of God's power. They could see it with their own eyes. Number three, and we'll finish here. I want you to notice they learned, they learned the value of inspirational and encouraging words. Look in verse number 17. And Joshua spake unto the house of Joseph, even to Ephraim and to Manasseh, saying, Thou art a great people and hast great power. Thou shalt not have one lot only, but the mountain shall be thine, for it is a wood, and thou shalt cut it down. And the outgoings of it shall be thine, for thou shalt drive out the Canaanites, though they have iron chariots, and though they be strong. You know what? You know what sometimes we need? We just need somebody to believe in us. We just need somebody to believe in us. Hey, those of you that are in administrative and, 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 and teaching positions here, can I encourage you? Believe in some of these kids. Believe in some of these students. I, look, I know I was a youth pastor for 14 years. I know how teenagers can be. I know, I, I know, Pastor Damon, you know, you were a youth pastor for a lot of years. You know, and sometimes I'm sitting here scratching my head saying, why would they do such a thing? And the reason why they would do such a thing is because they're kids. And I did similar things when I was their age. You know what, you know what sometimes these kids need? They need somebody that will just believe in them. Hey, look, I, I know you're dealing with some things, but I've got, I've got confidence in you. You're going to go somewhere in life. God's going to use you. You have incredible potential. God has a plan and God has a purpose for your life. And I'm here to tell you that one of the reasons why I stand here today is because some people believed in me. In moments in which I didn't even believe in myself. And there were people that believed in me and I'd look at them and say, do they, do they know what they're doing? Why would you believe in me? I'm a knucklehead. I'm a fool. I do stupid things and, and I didn't even have belief in myself. But listen, there were some people that said, you can do this. There's some people that gave me some opportunities and put me in some positions where I, I, I could expand and I can grow a little bit. And Joshua says, look, I'm not just going to give you something. I'm going to make you work for it. And I'm not just going to eliminate your fears. I'm going to make you face your fears. But here's what I am going to do. Here's what I am going to give you. I'm going to give you some confidence because I believe in you. I believe that you're going somewhere and that you can do something. 
And Joshua, I believe, gave them something far more valuable than had he just given them a new plot of land without any of these things. He forced them, he forced them to put some hard work into it. March up to the top of that mountain and cut down that tree. Get some blisters on your hands and sweat a little and cut yourself a little as you're working and, and, and bruise yourself a little. It's good for you. And face some fears. And don't just remove and eliminate every obstacle. But here's what I will give you. I'll give you the fact that I believe in you. I have confidence in you. You can do this. And so can you. And so can I. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 23, a man hath joy by the answer of his mouth and a word spoken in due season. How good is it? Proverbs 25, 11 says this, a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold and pictures of silver. Hebrews 11, or excuse me, 3, 13 says, but exhort one another daily while it is called a day. Young people, I just want to finish today by saying this. I believe in you. I'm looking at, I am looking at future missionaries, future pastors, future evangelists, future Christian school administrators, future Christian school teachers. I'm looking at future mamas and daddies. I'm looking at, I'm looking at young people that, listen, you're going to do something with your life. And you know why Fairhaven Baptist College exists? Because these people believe in you. And they believe that they can equip you and they can give you some things that will help you when you leave this place. And you know why this Christian school exists? Because they believe in you. And they believe that by pouring themselves into you and trying to influence you, that you can emerge a different person than the way that you came in and you can do something with your life. I want you to know something even better than me believing in you, or Pastor Dameron believing in you, Pastor Armacost believing in you. Listen, there's a God in heaven who believes in you. There's a God in heaven who has given you his Holy Spirit and he has, he has sealed you with the spirit of promise and he's, got, he's placed a call upon your life and he's got a purpose for you and for you alone to do. God believes in you. So go do it. Whatever God's put in your heart, go do it. And work hard at it and face your fears. And I'm going to pray that someone comes along. Maybe it's me today. Maybe it's some of these administrators, maybe some of the friends in the dorm that you live with, that somebody comes along and props you up with some encouraging words. You're going to do great things. You're going to do great things. Would you bow your heads with me?